So now that we've entered this idea of aqueous solutions or aqueous stoichiometry, the question that very quickly was, we're going to run into is how do we determine whether an ionic substance will disassociate or not? Let me rephrase that. How can I determine whether an ionic substance will, ready, quote unquote, dissolve or not? Will it break apart in water? Now, I said it correctly the first time. Remember, an ionic compound disassociates. This is something that is going to break up into separate ions in solution. So how do we go about figuring out when I put a substance into water if it creates ions or not? And the answer is pretty straightforward. Solubility rules! Well, just like we had our nomenclature rules, we now have solubility rules! And what that means is that you're once again going to have to memorize certain key substances and certain key ions that when you see them, you are automatically going to know this disassociates in water. Now, just like we did with nomenclature, I'm going to help you by creating a series of boxes. And if you treat these boxes just like we did before in a higher hierarchical order, in other words, box one is will overtake box two, but as long as you do it in that hierarchy, if you follow it, then I promise this is as simplified a version of solubility rules that you're ever going to see. So let's start off with our first box, which we refer to as always soluble. Okay, now I'm saying the word soluble. I should probably say always disassociate, but tomato, tomato right now, if you hear me say soluble and it's an ionic compound, you know that it's breaking apart into two separate ions. So always soluble. Any metallic compound that contains a group one metal. So who were our group one metals? Well, this is going to be lithium compounds, sodium compounds, potassium compounds, cesium compounds, and rubidium compounds. Any compound that contains one of those group one metals and whatever else is always going to be soluble in water. Now, please, before we go any further, understand that I am painting with a very large roll brush. That means that these are broad strokes. I can always find an exception for any one of these boxes or any one of these rules, quote unquote. But for the most part, you'll probably be okay if you see a group one metal compound, soluble in water. Also, any compound that contains one of the following five polyatomic ions. NO3 negative, better known as nitrate. CH3COO negative, better known as acetate. Perchlorate, ClO4 negative, and his cousin chlorate, ClO3 negative one. And finally, the ammonium ion, NH4 plus one. So if you see ammonium, whatever, soluble. If you see lead Roman numeral four nitrate, soluble. Okay, the minute you see a compound that contains one of those, you know this thing is going to be soluble and you can just go ahead and roll it and move on to the next one. Now, box number two is going to have some exceptions. So box number two represents the halides. Now recall, a halide is nothing more than a group 17 ion. Okay, so a halide is group 17. This is going to be my fluorines, my chlorines, my bromines, my iodines. Okay, so all group 17 compounds, right? So all, all compounds that contain a halide are always soluble unless they're bonded to silver ions. And then the two that I affectionately refer to as my fat bastards, which are lead plus two and mercury plus two. And I refer to them as my fat bastards because if you find them on your periodic table, you're going to notice that they're all the way down there at the bottom. And the best answer I have for why these guys will always be the exception is I genuinely believe that these metals are so large and so massive that water just has a difficult time not only breaking it apart, but then suspending it in solution. 
So these are two metals that typically, whenever they hook up with anybody, are always going to fall like a stone. They will do something that we refer to precipitate out of solution. They'll fall out of solution. So uh, silver, lead, and mercury. These are my big exceptions to my halogens. Now, sidebar. One of my halogens is going to be fluorine, F negative, right? And the fluoride ion is a teeny tiny ion. So a lot of times, while fluoride is soluble in a variety of compounds, whenever there's an exception to the rule, in other words, whenever there's a halide that didn't disassociate in water, chances are it was a fluoride compound. Okay? So if you run into an exception, and there are plenty that deal with fluorine, chances are that's what's happening. So you might sit there and have a compound like calcium fluoride, CAF2, CAF2, and go, ooh, soluble, and then come to find out that no, it actually has a really hard time breaking apart in water. No shocker, it's that fluoride exception. Again, these are general rules. After box number two, we're now going to roll right to box number three, and box number three are going to be my sulfates, my SO4 2 minus compounds. So all sulfates are soluble unless bonded to, and notice you got the fat bastard showing up again, so lead and mercury. And then, and the best suggestion I have here is look at a periodic table so you can see where they're at. But then the ones that are exceptions are going to be barium, strontium, and calcium. And if you notice, they're in group two of your periodic table. They start at the bottom with barium, and then you have strontium, and then you have calcium. So those three are going to be insoluble. In other words, they will not disassociate in water when bonded to sulfate. The last one that I'm going to add to this, kind of a late add, but he also is going to be one that typically is going to be very difficult to disassociate with the sulfate, is going to be, and I'll bring him back up, is going to be my silver ion. So again, silver is one that you're going to see constantly pop up if it has a tough time breaking apart, and silver's in there, that's probably what happened. So, box numbers one, two, and three were all about substances that disassociate in water. So box number four is going to be everyone that is insoluble in water. And when you sit there and say, well, what's left? The answer is everybody else. Everybody. What do I mean by everybody? Well, who have we not talked about? I didn't mention carbonate ions. Guess what they must be in water? Probably insoluble. Well, what about things like oxides or sulfides, compounds that contain oxygen or compounds that contain sulfur? Guess what? Probably insoluble. Well, what about phosphates or phosphites or arsenate or chromate or oxalate? Insoluble, 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 insoluble. Why? Because Everyone that wasn't mentioned in either box one, two, or three falls into box four, and suddenly they're going to be insoluble. Does that mean then that there is no way for me to ever break apart a carbonate ion? No. What I probably am going to have to do, and I might need to go back for this, but I might need to hook up my carbonate ion with a group one metal. Or I might have to hook up my carbonate ion with something like an ammonium ion. So why do I say this? Well, because again, remember, there's a hierarchy to these boxes. And box one takes precedent over box two, three, or four. In other words, if I have sodium carbonate, well, sodium's a group one metal, and sodium's always soluble in water. So therefore, sodium carbonate will be soluble in water. But if instead of having sodium carbonate, I have something like iron Roman numeral 2 carbonate, well, I never talked about iron. I never talked about carbonate. Guess what? Insoluble. 
Now, last little caveat with box number four. Everyone that wasn't mentioned is always insoluble, except, and we'll kind of put a little star on that one, hydroxides, except OH negative. Why? Well, hydroxides, and again, I keep saying this, as we'll see later on, tend to form bases. Remember that thing you learned about in middle school, acid, bases, whatever you call it? Well, there are a few bases, eight to be exact, that we refer to as strong bases. And a strong base will break apart, let me rephrase that, a strong base will disassociate completely. And so my strong bases, now you're not going to be surprised by five of these, are all my group one metal hydroxides. So lithium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, rubidium hydroxide, cesium hydroxide. Why are you not surprised that any of those are strong bases or that they break apart completely? Because all of them deal with group one metals that always disassociate in water. But the other three, this is where, again, look at your periodic table. You went down the first column of the periodic table. Now kind of hook around. And as you, so you go down and as you hook around, right, you're going to notice that you now have the second column. And on that second column, we're going to have barium hydroxide, strontium hydroxide, and calcium hydroxide. So any one of those eight compounds, any one of those eight substances will always disassociate completely in water. Since they disassociate completely in water, we expect to see them as nothing more than ions floating around. So, what is the expectation? Well, perhaps your teacher is going to expect you to know all of these solubility rules! And if they do, you get some work to do. Others of your professors or teachers may give you these rules and then you just have to apply them. Whatever the case is, what we'll do in our next episode is we're going to play one of America's favorite games where we're going to figure out if it's soluble or insoluble and why. So we take it one step at a time, one tick at a talk, and you'll be there in virtually no time.